Today, I have the pleasure of hosting Wendell Bryant, a 2023 graduate of the Institute of World Politics, Master of Arts in Statecraft and National Security Program. Um, Wendell is currently serving in the U.S. Army as a captain. Um, so, Wendell, thank you so much for being here today. It's great to see you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'd love to start out um, by, by hearing a little bit more about your time in the Army. I know that you've served as a U.S. Army field artillery officer for many years. And so tell me about what that's like and what led you to this. Uh, that's actually an interesting question for me in particular. Um, I can't actually tell you why I wanted to join other than the fact that I just love the United States. I loved the Army. Both my parents are Air Force. Uh, and so they actually hated the idea that I was joining the Army. So uh, I, I can't tell you. My grandfather, both my grandfathers were in the Army. I think that probably had something to do with it. I had a fascination with World War II for a little while. I think that may have had something to do with it as well. But uh, uh, I had always, always wanted to join, always wanted to serve. Uh, you know, it's awesome being part of the greatest country in the world. And I feel like I've given my little two cents back to it as, as best I possibly can. Um, I've been serving the Army for 10 years now. Um, I was stationed in Korea for two years. I was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington for two years. I was stationed at Fort Hood for four. And then I've spent two years in DC. Um, I have been, um, I guess, rot I have rotated to Korea, Bulgaria, Germany, Romania, and I have deployed to uh, Turkey. Wow, oh my goodness. So what is it like a day in the life? Day in the life of the uh, army, ooh, that's an interesting question. Um, it's not exactly what you would anticipate it to be. So a lot of the military and specifically the army is redundant. It's over and over again because you practice the same, um, I guess, formations, uh, practice the same patterns to prepare for an eventual war. Um, but when you don't have a, um, an enemy in front of you, or if you practice, it just doesn't feel the same. And so uh, a lot of soldiers will get tired uh, of just doing practices. It's like pra practicing for baseball, but never actually getting to play a game. Obviously, you want to play a game. Uh, and so a lot of, for me anyways, is to make sure soldiers remain engaged, uh, providing them avenues in which they no longer feel there's a monotony occurring. Uh, there's a lot of paperwork involved. Um, the Army is, in fact, uh, operates just like any corporation, but with one obvious difference. We don't produce anything. We provide something. Um, but other than that, uh, uh, that's one of my main perspectives is to make sure that soldiers remain engaged effectively. Awesome. And so tell me about your next assignment, which I know that you're starting out right now. Uh, so I was uh, selected as an ROTC instructor at Howard University just down the road. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, right now, my uh, uh, the colonel that's in charge of me, he is deciding whether or not I'll be MS3 or MS4 instructor, MS3 meaning a junior, and MS4 meaning a senior. Um, two totally different courses, MS3 will prepare cadets, our third year college students, for um, something called a cadet summer training, which is a four week um, training event to evaluate their capabilities. And on the MS4 side, they've already completed that school. Uh, and so now you're preparing them for how regular army operates, things that may uh, allow them to sidestep some uh, friction points they otherwise wouldn't be aware of. Okay, awesome. So tell me about what you, um, tell me a little bit more about the summer um, program and how they would prepare for it. Uh, so there's probably four or five main elements. The first one would be making sure that the cadets are physically fit, obviously necessary in the military to make sure that uh, they can handle physically stressful situations, physically, uh, physical endurance. Uh, another one would definitely be op order production. Uh, so an op order or operations order is a document uh, and a presentation of information to your soldiers uh, to clearly and concisely describe to them what their future mission will be. Uh, so sometimes an op order is um, something as simple as fix this vehicle. And the other op orders are take this hill. 
and then how to tactically apply those soldiers in the most efficient and effective way to achieve those objectives. Uh, and so an op order well-written provides all soldiers um, a clear understanding of what is about to happen. Uh, additionally, uh, the, uh, the tactical side, uh, so teaching uh, cadets the um, idea of flanks, how to walk through, how to march, um, how to uh, create an ambush, uh, those kind of smaller tactical things uh, provide evaluators the ability to uh, assess whether or not they know what they're doing if they've prepared for the scenario. Uh, and so the summer training is supposed to be stressful, um, force uh, cadets to make decisions rapidly, uh, which provides the Army a more effective means to properly evaluate whether or not uh, their, um, their, the quality of individual is good for the, for the Army. Mm -hmm. it's, it sounds like a big test. Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, you can fail it. Um, it's, uh, if you're not aware of what is in CST, it can catch you. It can catch you off guard. Uh, but the Army does not try to trick you. It's very straightforward. They provide you all the resources, all the things you need to learn. Uh, but there is one thing that the army can't teach you, and that's courage. You have to build that up yourself. So in a stressful situation, it's not, oh, just like the, the, the word courage, uh, it's not not being afraid. It is being afraid and still making a decision. And that's what the army is looking for. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So you've spent all this time in the army. Where did where did grad school fit into your life plan? Uh, so um, when I went through my bachelor's, uh, the army gave me the ability to obtain something called a grad so, which is basically I give the army seven years in my contract instead of four, and they provide me the means to go to grad school paid for by the army. Uh, and so for the last two years, I went to IWP, um, and that was my job. Uh, so I did no regular army duties. That's awesome. So you were really able to dive in and participate fully in the academics. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was a, a fascinating and wonderful opportunity. Um, I, uh, it was, uh, it, it was a jewel to find, uh, and I'm, I'm very fortunate that the army provided me such an opportunity. That's great. So how did you, I mean, with all the grad schools, how did you pick IWP? How did you pick this field to go into? So um, I had a conversation with my father and uh, he he's a pilot and was flying with an admiral. And the admiral was discussing that the future of the world was in information dominance. And so my dad, every time I mentioned I might be going to grad school, he'd say, well, you should look into information dominance. And I typed it in a couple of times in Google or, you know, a search engine trying to look what, what is this information dominance. And I only found two schools that populated any, any adage that would be considered information dominance. And it was the Naval War College and it was IWP. Oh, interesting. Uh, and so information dominance is exactly what we describe in the intelligence community, uh, you know, where you take all elements of information and actually build a picture. Uh, and so it's getting more and more difficult to build a picture, not because we're less intelligent. It's there's so much information to sift through uh, that it becomes convoluted and difficult to distinguish what the truth is. Uh, so there's a lot of misinformation and propaganda and uh, disinformation on top of that. Uh, so the, you know, there's a lot of elements and being able to capture a picture out of the void of information <laughs> uh, makes it an extremely powerful asset for any organization, uh, especially if you can do it rapidly, which in the military, a rapidly, uh, building a picture rapidly is key to success. Wow. So you just decided to come here to study that? Yes, absolutely. All right. <laughs> I wasn't going to go to the Naval War College. <laughs> I'm Army. Go Army beat Navy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. So do you feel like you, you learned about that sufficiently here during your degree program? So I think I learned, so uh, a lot of the things IWP teaches, I, I have been 
uh, involved with personally or professionally. Uh, so uh, initially it felt redundant, uh, but then IWP get, provided me perspective, uh, provided me historical precedents, uh, provided me multiple ways of looking at problems. Uh, and so what I initially thought was a program that I wasn't going to assist me, it very quickly became obvious that IWP was prov providing me uh, perception, perspective, uh, and uh, a greater wealth of knowledge and access. And on top of that, the uh, um, network that IWP, that, that is powerful by itself. Being able to be included in conversations with diplomats and uh, operations officers from the CIA and the FBI and seeing every single perspective, not only from the teacher's perspective, but also from the people that are involved on the alumni side. So Wendell, what was it like being an active duty army officer on campus here? Just like in general? Um, so I think for the first time I felt like the senior man in the room. Uh, so obviously in my job, there is always a boss. Uh, there is always someone that outranks you. And in most cases, a ton of people that outrank you. Um, but here, I think I was in the top five oldest and most experienced student. Obviously, there's some, some exceptions because some people have 20 years experience coming to the school. Uh, but being a, um, a full-time student, I was one of the few that were constantly here and had really fascinating conversations. I got to see, I guess, the naivety of a lot of students and got to help them. It's like, hey, take a step back and take a more broad, a more knowledge-based, a more wise, common sense approach. We all have our ideals and we want those ideologies to be applied, but if they don't survive reality, well, then they're not really worth anything at all. Uh, and so it was really fun for me to actually engage uh, a, a younger crowd. You know, yeah. on, on that, uh, on a professional basis. That's so cool. And so you, you were very active on campus. I know that you started our Alexander Hamilton society chapter here at IWP. Um, I'd love to hear about your experience doing that. Uh, so, um, the president asked me to create the chapter, uh, and it took me about a month to, you know, set it up. And then every other week we basically had political geopolitical discussions. Um, we try to war game sometimes. We try to uh, what what if scenarios, those those kind of things. Um, and I love that kind of uh, thought process. Uh, I, I love science fiction. I love uh, military history. And so discussing the what if scenarios kind of just ties both sides perfectly into what I love to discuss. Uh, and I think it all made us collectively more intelligent because uh, we were taking information from all students and all their perspectives and including their experiences. So we had one student, uh, she was in Russia, or actually we had two students that were in Russia. So we got to see some direct from the source, their experience and how the Russians think. We had another gentleman who, um, uh, he was a corporate assistant and basically did corp not corporate espionage, but collected on other companies and uh, basically prepared his company to compete with the uh, incoming products. Uh, and then we had a lot of other students uh, all coming from different backgrounds and it just really made a fascinating discussion. Uh, I, I, there was a ton of political uh, dis discourse and disagreement, but it was extremely professional uh, it was really fascinating. Uh, I hope the, hope the chapter keeps going because it, it was something that just really nested within what I love to do is have good, meaningful discussion that results in developing a more intelligent body. That's awesome. Wow. Well, thank you for making that possible for all of our students. What a, what a really cool opportunity for everyone. It was awesome. It really was awesome. Yeah. I loved it. That's great. And you also participated in the student speaker series. Um, you gave a lecture on uh, Chernobyl um, last September. So tell me about that experience. What was it like to present as a part of our public series? 
So uh, one of my professors, Dr. Kodakevich, he brought, uh, pulled me aside almost immediately after completing the paper. And he's like, hey, this paper's pretty good. Do you want to do, um, do you want to speak on it? Uh, I had no inclination that that was even a possibility. And I wasn't really aware of how IWP had designed its, I guess, programs. And so I was like, yeah, you'll just talk in front of a bunch of people and uh, there'll be a bunch of questions and answer air, uh, window. Uh, and, uh, you know, just empower people with information. Uh, I absolutely loved it. Uh, if you watch the video, I'm not the greatest speaker, uh, but you can see my demeanor change halfway through after the presentation is over because the question and answer was just awesome. I loved uh, war gaming, the, the why I created certain conclusions and um, my paper uh, specifically just honed in on Chernobyl being the the straw that broke the camel's back of the Soviet Union. It was the first of many problems the Soviet Union dealt with. And it was just interesting that we witnessed something which was a cataclysmic event, but in the course and size of the Soviet Union, you wouldn't you would think one nuclear generator going critical wouldn't be enough to damage the Soviet Union so much, but it it really did. And and it had a lot less to do with the environmental impact and the impact on people. It had a lot more to do with just the political perception of the Soviet Union. It weakened its status uh, globally. Yeah, that's fascinating. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you for participating in the, the academic lecture series. Oh, I loved that's, it. That's it was awesome. a wonderful opportunity. That's awesome. Um, so I'd love to I'd love to go back to to your your army and your your. Uh, um, your next steps, do you think that you're going to be using your IWP education at all in your um, work with the ROTC program at Howard? I think so. Absolutely. Um, I think IWP provides me an apolitical observation of the geopolitical world. Uh, and so I think I can diplomatically present ideas to future officers so that they make, and it doesn't need to be political per se, but just seeing other, other perceptions, other perspectives, and other ways of doing things. Uh, there was a captain I served with at Fort Lewis, and he always, when I made a mistake, he'd say, well, that is a way. Might not be the way, but is, that, is, that is a way. And uh, he, he's a very hilarious guy. Uh, but it, his friendly banter about saying that's a way, it's like, that's a way you can do it, but there's probably a better way. And I think IWP has provided me the resources and um, mental uh, acuity to be able to present that to cadets and prepare them for the future, make them better leaders uh, for, for the Army. That's awesome. Um, I now have a few advice questions. Um, what advice would you give to somebody who's considering going into the Army? Hmm, that's, that's a good one. Um, I know a lot of my best soldiers got out of the army because it wasn't what they had anticipated. And I think they believed that they were gonna be shooting guns all the time or you know shooting uh, artillery shells or mortar rounds or tank rounds and all the cool stuff that the army has. And the army has all of that awesome stuff. Um, but when you take a step back and think, well, you got to clean those systems, you got to take care of those vehicles, you got to make sure that you go through the uh, refueling process and taking care of the engine and all of these things start to sound less army and more like, you know, maintenance and mechanics and, uh, you know, being a clean, uh, pro providing a clean system. And so I think if soldiers come into the army knowing that it's not purely glamorous, uh, they're, they're, what they anticipate provides them a more realistic perception of what they're actually gonna deal with. Um, so they'll get to shoot guns, and they'll get to throw grenades and all the awesome stuff, but it is drastically less of the time than what you would anticipate as a young 18 year old joining the army. Right, okay, that's so interesting. Um, and what advice would you give to a new student who's starting at IWP to kind of get the most out of their experience? Challenge the professors. Uh, so um, when I was going through the courses, uh, 
and I think this is for most graduate programs or any kind of advanced degree, is that your classes, classes are smaller and the professor no longer should be dictating to you what you need to read specifically. You should be actively doing those things for yourself and then be ready to engage the professor, whether you agree or disagree, doesn't matter, uh, without having to resort going back to the book. You should have already taken care of that. Uh, so I'd say being an avid, uh, aggressive reader will empower a student. Uh, but also, um, when a professor says something you disagree with, fire back. Uh, these professors here or any graduate program have decades of experience, whether academically or, or in the real world, uh, on the government side, private sector. And so what you might think is a brilliant idea, and then they present to you why your idea um, idealistically or technically might be correct when you apply other factors that you weren't anticipating. Uh, not only do you gain more knowledge as to why it is the way it is, but now you can apply that critical thinking to other aspects of a broad range of problem sets that exist in the geopolitical front. That's so interesting. So were you always uh, challenging your professors? I was, I was. Uh, I. If you probably talked to him, I was the one who always, uh, I, I, I assume most students hated me because oh, no. I was the one who was asking all the questions, who was arguing, who was, uh, I wanted to engage. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I engaged with Dr. Kodakevich, Dr. Sigronis, or, uh, uh, Dr. Schroeder was fascinating. Uh, there was a lot of good professors, Dr. Thomas. Uh, I don't want to miss anyone. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to list them all, but just fascinating. Uh, and especially when they have 30 years experience on top of their education, just makes them an absolute asset. And it'd be a failure on the students if they didn't engage the professors. Uh, more than a few times, I, I would talk for a couple hours after class with professors. Um, you now the army provided me that window because I know there's a lot of professional students here who are working almost a full-time job while going to school. So that opportunity might not be made to them. But if you're a full-time student here, you have to engage those professors. Uh, that, that, like, that is what you're purchasing when you come to IWP is the experience. Yeah. The biggest impact I've made on my career is yeah. unobservable. What I believe is, is I've helped soldiers, but I don't know if I've actually helped them. Okay. So I'd have to call up a bunch of soldiers and I'm assuming half of them would lie to make me feel better about myself. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, pushing a couple of soldiers along when it comes to, um, you know, uh, get your degree. You know, if the Army's provided you the ability to get your education for free or for at low cost, that's an opportunity you just can't pass by. And, uh, some soldiers take advantage of that pro those kind of programs, and some, most soldiers don't. Uh, and so every occasionally, I'll have a soldier that actually finally jumps on it. I'm like, yeah, someone's someone's you know furthering not only their academic career but their professional career simultaneously, and that's exciting to see. Um, I love it when I see like the light pop up on a soldier's eyes when you present to them like a different perspective. Uh, one of my mentors uh, in, at Fort Hood he kind of did something like that for me. Um, and it, it was kind of focused in on the logistical side of the army and how though the US might have the most tactically and technically superior military uh, in the world, it's our logistical system that really empowers us uh, to be able to action globally anywhere in the world with limited hesitation, like almost no hesitation. And that's really what makes us such a powerful asset. And he said it so succinctly. He said it so clearly that I was like, wow, I mean, everyone needs to hear this conversation because it's so empowering that, uh, you know, I'm not sure if you ever heard of a pogue before, but basically it's a derogatory name for anyone who's not a frontline soldier. Uh, so, you know, infantry, armor, artillery, engineers, uh, they'll, you know, make fun of anyone who's supporting them. But it really brings into light just how important every supporting function is to make sure that the machine continues to turn. Um, my grandfather always said, uh, for every soldier you have shooting, there's 10 soldiers or uh, supporting personnel behind them. 
So that's how massive the infrastructure is. So if you've got a thousand soldiers, you have 10,000 people supporting those thousand soldiers. But it comes to you know providing the ammunition, providing the food, the clothes, uh, fuel, uh, all these supporting elements are extraordinarily important to make sure those organizations continue to function and you know defeat the, the, or conquer the objectives. So. So Wendell, what's your favorite thing about serving with the Army? I think this might be something that's pretty commonplace for most individuals in the Army, but it, it really is the other soldiers you serve with. Um, so, you know, a lot of companies produce a product. Um, so, you know, Ford produces cars. Well, the Army pro Army's product is people, is producing soldiers that work seamlessly together uh, that defend each other, uh, and then also simultaneously take objectives um, you know, that support each other in making sure they, they stay alive, they stay healthy, uh, and they continue to grow. Uh, the Army's objective is always to create leaders uh, and having a support network from the very bottom all the way to the very top really um, creates a organization that is second to none. Uh, and the Army continues to improve itself. Uh, uh, and it's, it's, it's impressive. Uh, and I have served with so many awesome walks of life, uh, different perspectives, hilarious guys that probably should have been professional comedians. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful place. And it's, a, it's full of every color and of emotion you could call for, you know, some people get angry, some people laugh the whole time. It, the, the, the element of, or the variety of uh, personalities is just awesome. Uh, and it creates a bond that's, that's quite strong and quite wonderful to be a part of. I'd also love to hear, Wendell, if you have any, if you have like an anecdote or a specific thing that happened at IWP that kind of represents your experience? Hmm. Well, that is a big question. Um, I don't think it was any one thing, and this might be redundant, but um, I thoroughly enjoyed the idea that IWP was attempting to be as neutral and apolitical as possible. Um, I think that has a lot to do with the fact that a lot of the professors have decades of experience in the fields they're discussing. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the fact uh, that they're dually professional and academic. Um, and I don't think I really noticed it until halfway through my time at IWP where this is a different type of institution. It's, it's not your typical school, uh, in a lot of schools, you can and tend to create teachers or professors or doctorates um, who high school, college, graduate school, PhD, and then they, they become a teacher with no actual experience in the fields they're talking about. And IWP does not have that problem at all. Every single professor has spent significant amount of time, a, a significant amount of time in their field of study. And that's just something you just don't find. And I loved it. I thought it was really powerful. So. That's great. Well, um, Wendell, thank you so much for being with us here today. Uh, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you, to hear about your, your work with the Army, your exciting plans with the ROTC. And um, yeah, thank you again for joining us. Well, thank you for having me.